We are in this, this uh, series from Colossians, and we called it Necessary. Um, and so today we're going to finish that up, and, and uh, so that means that we're not going to go to the very end uh, of, uh, of the book, right? Uh, but we are going to read from chapter 3 today on Necessary Focus. And one of the things we have mentioned, of course, is that Paul speaks here in Colossians uh, terms that are not just helpful, not just good. You know, this will be something that can add a little bit to your life. He said, these are necessary things. If you want to live as a Christian, and if you want to be able to sing along, which is my favorite thing, I post that sometimes. This is my favorite uh, few sentences here. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Yes? Let's say that. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. For that to be reality, we need to listen to Paul and what he is saying here. So allow me here to, to read with you. Uh, if you have your Bible, it's Colossians chapter 3, the first 11 verses. And uh, if you don't have it uh, here, uh, he, you know, just look on the screen. For those of you uh, at home, we are so grateful you're here. If you're in town, come on in. And, and I want to say to everyone, you know, if you're listening and you said, hey, I got to go down and pray with someone, just come on. You can get in the car, come on. We'll be here for a while. And those of you who are in the pew, if you're in the middle of something, said, hey, I need to just spend some time praying now. We're church, friend, right? There's an altar here. Well, I don't know, but there's some steps here, <laughs> right? And, and uh, just come on down, right? This is a spiritual place that we want God to work. The most important thing is not what I say. It's not the song you pray. I mean, you sing. It's not necessarily uh, who you think is, you are yourself. It is what God is doing in your heart, yes? And that can happen right here, right now. So let's read. Paul begins with a kind of a phrase that I would like to translate since. I think that's actually a much better translation. Many translations are doing this, but in this here it says, so if. But since, since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient, and you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ. There is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all in all. And may I say before I did dive into this text also, since we are in this 4th of July week, you know, we, we need to kind of be very clear uh, on these things. Right? We are so grateful that God has given us a nation like we have, and a place to live like we have. But don't confuse that with freedom. The freedom to do and say and just do whatever you jolly well please is not Christian freedom, yes? That is a freedom we enjoy in this place. There are Christians right now, and we should pray for them every day, who come together in hiding, underground, and, and celebrate the freedom they have in Christ. And if they come up, up above and said the same thing, they would have no head the next day or maybe that afternoon. Are you hearing me? They are still finding freedom in Christ. I, I want us to hear that, not to confuse these kinds of things. We are so grateful uh, for the freedoms that we have, but let's not think that that equates what Christ gives to a person 
because we have Christians all over the globe that know nothing of the kind of freedoms we have in this place. And maybe I should say one thing. I, I thought about it, and then I thought, maybe not. Then I said, well, maybe. <laughs> you know, some of you are old enough to remember there was a dictator in, in Romania called Ceausescu. Well, he fell, and then suddenly, you know, Christians were free. I had a Baptist leader come up and to speak to us about that. I was overseas at the time. And he said, and I had to translate it. It was not hard. It was my church. Yeah? And he gets up and he says, friends, pray for us that we now that we have our freedom does not become as lax about our faith as you are. I don't know what you translate that. I would look at him and said, I don't want to say that. <laughs> but there was a lot of to that, right? They, they were packed in. I'd done revivals there. They were packed in with, you know, standing room only, four-hour services. You were literally that far. It's like being in the subway in New York City almost when you were in church. It's just the reality that we can sometimes use our freedom not for the sake of Christ, but it's for the sake of ourselves. And we need to kind of li listen to Paul when he says here, there's a necessary focus that comes with this. And the words here are strong, and I need to be careful uh, that I don't spend too much time, but there's so much wealth and richness in this text. Uh, when you start looking at this and just begin to see here, he says, strive for this, right? So seek the things above. And that word is one of these strong kind of words that can be translated seek, can be translated as, you know, yearn for, focus on, uh, give yourself to, surrender to, strive for. It is one of these very, very kind of strong words. And I thought about, uh, you know, what would the Danish word be? And the Danish word actually plays on that word funnel. It's kind of a, the word funnel that is turned into a verb in a, in a way. Um, and so funnel after, if you think about that for just a second, uh, you would see what does a funnel do? It kind of it collects all your thought and focuses it all in one direction. That's really what Paul is after right here, that we want to focus our minds, our hearts, our efforts, our life in one direction. It, it's not just a, a good thing to focus. It's a necessary thing to focus. And I want to say this also. So those of you who are into photography, you may know this a little bit, right? If, if you want to really focus on something, you do a very low depth in the photography, right? You, so what do you have? Like a portrait? You pull that out, and the things around becomes strangely dim. Oh, yeah? Remember that? And that is what, what you do when you, when you see something that is truly in focus, then the things around are not quite as focused in on. And I think that is exactly what Paul is trying to do right here. Think about verse 2, right? Set your minds upon, focus on the things above. That's where you attach your attention. That is where you fasten your focus, if you will. That is where you direct your drive. All of who you are needs to come from this one point, be fed by the direction that comes from above. And if you read all of, all of the uh, letters to the Colossians, you will see somewhat of a clear distinction here, or shift, if you will. The first two chapters, we have dealt with them somewhat in detail, uh, and we saw how Paul is just grinding down and making sure they understand that Christ is fully sufficient for all things in life. And so if that's the case, then therefore, since that is the case, so chapter 3 now switches and begins now to apply. The first reality is this. Christ is fully sufficient. This is who he is. Therefore, live like this. And if you study the Bible a little bit, especially uh, Paul, uh, you will notice that th that is kind of the way he always argues. He is not like the parent who just says, do this, and the kids say, why? 
say, well, and you have no argument because it's a dumb thing you're asking to do, so you just say, because I told you so. Some of you have done that, yeah? Because there was no argument. Paul never does that. He establishes fact and reality. This is how it is. This is who God is. This is what God does. Therefore, if that is who you are in Christ, you must do these things. We call that in technical language indicative, the statement of fact that leads to imperative what we must do. Paul always does that. Christ, what broke down the wall that barriers, therefore you can have no divisions among you. That's kind of how he argues. He doesn't just say don't have divisions because that's a dumb thing. He says Christ has broken down that barrier. Therefore, you can have no division because that would no longer illustrate who Christ is. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. So, in fact, uh, what Paul is doing here by setting it up like this is to say <clears throat> the main difference between paganism or pagan religions is just that. If you're a pagan or a pagan religion, you know, there's no direct relationship between faith and practice. All you need to do is to pay homage to whatever God or whatever gods that, that, that guides, you know, your faith statement or whatever. But in the Christian faith, the very expression of your love for Christ comes out in a changed lifestyle. You have seen the example in Jesus and you try to live out that example in your own life. That's Christian faith in contrast to paganism. Christian faith can be turned into paganism when that, that's the reality that goes before it. So look here and look at these things that he's saying. How is it possible to live that life of resurrection since you have been raised with Christ? Then what? What is the reality here? How is it possible even to live a life that is characterized by victory over misery and sin and pain and evil? How? Well, you got to focus. There's a necessary focus. Focus on what? to the things that come from above. Jesus says it this way. He says, because I live, you shall live. And here Paul says, since you have been raised, this is how you live. That is the very quality of what we see here. When the Bible speaks about eternal life, it's not just about a life that is once to come. It's about a life that begins already now, that has a certain quality, there's a quantity to it, it never ends, and there's a quality to it that looks in a certain kind of way. In fact, it is exemplified by Christ. Can I say this to you also? When we speak about life, there's sometimes people use that as a mere antonym or the, the word that expresses the opposite of death. But life in the biblical sense is so much more than the opposite of death. Life happens. For example, when you see kids playing and they're jumping around and they are laughing their hearts out and they're just having the best time and they run up to you and, and the eyes are sparkling and they, they try to get words out because they want to say them so fast to explain how good a time they have. That's life in that kind of biblical sense. Life is what happens when teenagers get together and they, they, they listen to the music they really love. They talk about, you know, a fast car, cool motorbikes or, or hot guys or, you know, whatever uh, they, may, they may talk about here. That is what happens. But it is also what happens when Paul says, friends, for me to live is Christ. The very definition of life for me is Christ. It is so much more than the opposite of death. Life is put in motion, if you will. Life is, is happening when excitement and joy kind of overflows, when you feel adrenaline kind of rush 
through your body and it, it gives you a new power to see things in a new light and energy to do things in a new way. Set your mind on the things above. Are we hearing this? I'm not just speaking, am I? You're hearing this. This is what happens here, right? To surrender your life to Christ is to die to yourself so that new life can come in, new adrenaline, if you will, will come in and reinvigorate everything about you. There was the old church father from the 4th century, St. Augustine, who said, if Christ does not get it all, he's not really getting anything. Or you may say, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You know, I realize that a lot of people are saying, you know, you can't just be so heavenly minded that, that we're no earthly good. And I get that. that. That's a fair criticism sometimes, but that's not the point. That is not the point right here. The point right here is exactly to say what drives the agenda is what comes from above. That's the point. It is not the point that we just kind of turn around and just see everything and we can't see it clearly because it's become dim. But the things that set our agenda, the things that get our, our drive, the things that, that places uh, or, or determines our goals, if you will, that they even decide our means, the ways that we do things, are the things we learn from above. Unfortunately, there are people, they come to faith in Christ, but their plans and their goals and their priorities change little. Sometimes you can meet people and, and there's been no substantial change in their lives. When that happens, faith becomes like an animal, it's like getting salt on the food. It may give it a different flavor, but no substantial change. And Paul says, to have this substantial change, there must be a necessary focus, a rethinking, a redirecting of where you get your drive from, where you get your direction from. Focus must be on the things above, not on the things here. I wonder, you know, Israel, some of you remember that, some of you uh, don't, and if you don't, just then that's fair enough, then, then uh, if you're new to the faith, just read the book of Exodus. Israel came out of Egypt. God, by mighty hand, opened the waters, led them into the desert, and then let them walk to the promised land. And it took about 18 months. That's all it took. Maybe even less than that, but probably about 18 months. Most scholars agree with that. About 18 months to walk to the promised land. Then they got there, and they decided not to go in. And so they had to turn back. And now they're walking 40 years around the desert until that whole generation, everyone 20 or older, had died out. The only two left, as far as we know from Scripture at least, is Joshua and Caleb. And then they come in, and you ask, what's the difference between Joshua and Caleb and all the others, even Moses? Well, Joshua and Caleb never lost their focus. They knew God had given a promise. They knew he would fulfill it. And they said, we can go in. When everybody says, let's not. And so, their hearts and their thoughts were set on the things above. And that changed everything in the way they did things here. That, friends, is God's word right here. Necessary focus. And then comes, and I'm just going to spend a minute on this, 
a kind of a, a negative word, uh, some would say, right? Therefore, verse 5, put to death what belongs to your, early, to your earthly nature. Put to death. So, you know, they're kind of negative. And some people are saying that, and, and I, I think that, that can be uh, true also. They say, just don't speak about these negative things, right? Just speak about the positive things. Talks about God's grace. You know, negative truths might come out. I mean, negative uh, warnings may come out of positive truths. And I see that. But that's not the whole truth. Right? You know, a beautiful garden does not come just by speaking about beautiful flowers. There are some weeds that must be pulled. That's just the reality of it. When you, when you look at some of these things, there are some things that must be pulled away, and that's why, why Paul is highlighting both. He strive for the things above and put to death. They're both active, delivered words, the things that really belong to this earth, that, that grows in the soil that is not from God. That, that's the point he is making. And we all find ourselves in, in difficult situations Every last one of us. It, it's just part of life. Again and again, we are confronted with the temptation to let the loyalty of Christ somewhat, uh, loyalty toward Christ somewhat uh, fall on his side, compromise. And again and again, we have to realize that it's not enough just to sing that if we turn our rights to Jesus, then everything else will be, will be dim. It takes more than a song. Notice in the verses there, and I won't have time to deal with them. They, they require uh, more time than we have this morning. But you can kind of apply that yourself. You know, if you look at verses 5 uh, through verse 8, or through verse, verse 7, these are emotional kind of earthly things, things that grow out of a mental state. They have to do with our emotions and our mind, our thinking. And then you move to verse 8 and 9, and that has to do with social sins, if you will, the things we do to that do not lie to one another. And so you see some of all these things, right? These things, Paul says, Put to death. I want to challenge all of us, friends. It's not easy. I have to kind of be quiet before God also as I was preparing this, right? Think through your own life. Just let your mind run through your own life. It comes to us in different ways, right? Different people put different things on a list like that. Things that is against heaven, so to speak. When you think through that, think through, hear this. All of that belongs to the old person. The old person that is no longer, or that, is, that has not yet been, if you will, raised with Christ before the new. And it's not that that, that has disappeared like this. It never worked like that. It's always like this. We still see it. Paul even says it, right? The good things I want to do, I find myself not doing, and the things I don't want to do, I still struggle with, and I still find myself doing. But the trajectory has changed, friends, and that's kind of where we are. And, and here is what is so powerful when you look at it. It switches now in verse 10. I'm going to wind up with this and just notice here, beautiful as this is, he uses imagery of putting on, like a, a new clothing. Put on your new self. And look here. Look here what is going on. There are two words for the word new. The new self, that word neon is, is the word, right? The Greek word neon, and it speaks to it speaks to a, a time kind of newness, right? This was before and this is after. There's something that has been transformed, changed from a before 
to an after. And then the next word, as you are being renewed yourself, that word is kainos, which means a qualitative change, a way, way of change in the way you think, in the way you are, in the way you constitute yourself, if you will. So both are, are here. There is a before and an after, and, and the renewal is not just that this has changed because time has gone, but there is a qualitative change that comes with that. And friends, that is true for you as an individual, and that is true for us as a church, and that is true also for us as a church in a period of transition. Something fresh, something different is going to happen and has been caused by Christ and it is happening as we focus on what is above. So let me end by one sentence here, a few sentences here, just say that we were formed as human beings in the image of Christ. Then we became deformed by sin. All the things that were listed in these verses that we somewhat just mentioned in passing. And now Christ is reaching out his hand and he offers to us that we can be transformed by his spirit and then be reformed in God's image. Did we get this? We were formed from the beginning in the image of God. Our own selfishness and rebellion deformed us from that image. But Christ has reached out and by his spirit he wants to transform us that we again can be reformed into his image. That is to live and to look and to be someone who exemplifies what he intended from the beginning. Set your minds, strive for, focus on the things above.